Hello and welcome to this talk. This is a keynote for the Eurographics 2021 conference. And it's a joy for me to give this talk because Eurographics was one of the first academic conferences I have ever attended in my life. This is a photograph of us on our way to Eurographics 2001. From left to right on this photograph is Olga Sorkin, Danny Coenor, and myself, much younger than we are now. Eurographics was held in England at this time. Here we are on our way to the conference, visiting Warwick Castle. We are full of young vim and vigor, and I believe since then both Olga and Danny have keynoted this conference and now I guess it's my turn. This talk is a follow-up on a talk that I gave about half a year ago, which was a keynote for the joint German conference on visual computing. That talk was called Towards Photorealism and this talk as a follow-up is further towards photorealism. I will not repeat what I presented in that talk. And I encourage all of you to watch that talk if you can, since there is some content there that I think is good, valuable, interesting, and I will not repeat it. Today's talk will be standalone and you will understand everything if you have not watched the previous talk. But the two go together, and I do encourage you to watch both of them. Today, we will begin with a new work called Stable View Synthesis that will be presented in a few months this summer at CVPR 2021. And it is the state-of-the-art approach to view synthesis it significantly improves on the two works that I presented in my last keynote called Free View Synthesis and NERF++. The Stable View Synthesis work is much, much better. I will follow that with some higher level remarks on opportunities in this area. And then we have a real treat. I will present something for the first time that has never been presented outside my lab and is not public yet. We are going to reveal this today in this talk. And this is a new work called Enhancing Photorealism Enhancement that has never been presented outside my lab and has been in progress in my lab for more than two years. This is one of the hardest things we've ever done. This was a significant investment over more than two years, and you are going to be the first to see this. Let's begin with stable view synthesis. This is a direct follow-up on the free view synthesis project that I presented in the last keynote. The setting is the same. We have a number of images of a scene, a large scale unstructured scene in the real world as in this tank museum. This is one of the scenes that gives the tanks and temples data set its name. Our goal is to process this set of input images so that we can move freely in the scene post hoc without being physically in it. We want to be able to render the appearance of this scene and have it be realistic from any point of view anywhere in the scene. Here are the results of free view synthesis, the work presented last year and the work I presented in my last keynote. And you can see that it's not bad. We are moving through the scene. We are synthesizing the appearance of the scene from entirely new viewpoints, we can move freely through this scene, but sometimes things go awry. Like here, something is wrong. Some regions of the 
seen are not rendered correctly. They are not depicted correctly. They are not painted correctly. There is some temporal instability and some regions once in a while are clearly missing. Here is stable view synthesis, the new work I am telling you about today. It is much cleaner, much stable, and the gross artifacts you saw in the free view synthesis results are largely gone. You don't have these big missing regions right in the, in, in the foreground. The appearance is clean and temporarily stable. And we can see this in this side-by-side -side comparison. On the left are the free view synthesis results. On the right are the stable view synthesis results. And it's clear that the stable view synthesis results are better. At their best, the free view synthesis results are, are excellent. But once in a while, it's clear that something goes wrong with free view synthesis, and you will understand what it is in just a few minutes. Let's take a look also at the results of NERF++, the other approach I presented last time. This is an extension of neural radiance fields to unbounded large-scale scenes that have content both in the foreground and in the background. It's doing something. It's reasonable, but there are clearly issues. There are blurring and patterning artifacts that you can see through the image. There is something not quite right with the appearance that is generated by NERF++. It's not bad, but it's not movie quality. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of NERF++ on the left with stable view synthesis on the right. It's a dramatic difference. The stable view synthesis results are much, much closer to essentially movie quality. They're not perfect. We're still not done, but they're much closer to reality, much cleaner than the appearance generated by NERF++. How do we do this? Well, like the view, free view synthesis approach, we operate on a geometric scaffold. This is a geometric model of the scene, a mesh, created by standard structure from motion, multi-view stereo, and 3D reconstruction. This is on purpose. One basic premise of this line of work is that we can interoperate with existing geometric 3D reconstruction pipelines so that we inherit whatever progress is made in 3D reconstruction. 3D reconstruction gets better year after year. It is a thriving research area. It has its own benchmarks and 3D reconstruction pipelines get better and better and better. And whatever improvements are made in that line of work will be inherited for free by the stable view synthesis line of work. As 3D reconstruction gets better, as 3D geometric models of scenes become more complete and more precise, this will translate immediately into improved view synthesis quality in the stable view synthesis methodology. Given this geometric scaffold produced by off-the-shelf 3D reconstruction, the prior approach, free view synthesis, did the following. Each source image was passed through a convolutional network that produced a tensor of features. For a number of nearby images to our target camera pose, these feature tensors were warped using the geometric scaffold. Depth maps from the geometric scaffold were used to guide the mapping of features from source input images 
to the target view. This gives us a number of target feature tensors in the target view that were then blended together by a recurrent convolutional network. And this recurrent convolutional network produced a number of color images with blending masks, and these were then integrated into the final image. As you can see, as you could see, this free view synthesis approach produced results that are reasonable, not, not bad, but there were some issues. Where did the issues come from? One major issue is the selection of source images. Where do these source images come from? Which source images do we take? In the free view synthesis approach, this was based by a geometric heuristic. This was done by a geometric heuristic that selected nearby camera views to the target camera view. So we have a target camera view, a camera that is looking at the scene, and there are some source images nearby, nearby cameras. The free view synthesis approach selected a number of nearby cameras and projected features from these nearby views into the target view. The selection was done based on the relationships between the camera poses. But this is fundamentally wrong because the actual appearance arises from the surface of the scene. The actual appearance is generated by the surface of the scene that interacts with light and creates radiance. At each point on the surface of the scene, each point may be seen by a different set of cameras. And in fact, exactly what set of cameras observes each point on the scene is not apparent from geometric relations between the cameras, between the origins and the orientations of the cameras. That's why you saw big missing regions once in a while in the free view synthesis results, because the set of source views selected for projection and blending by this geometric heuristic didn't quite account for some regions of this scene which were observed by other cameras. How do you know what cameras observe any point on the scene? Very easy, you just look at the point itself. Don't look at the cameras, look at the point. From the point itself, you can understand which cameras see it. And that is one of the key ideas in the stable view synthesis approach. The stable view synthesis approach completely dispenses with the selection of uh, source views that are blended into, uh, into the target view. It operates on the surface itself. And for each point on the surface, it asks, what are the cameras that see this point? What are the source images that depict this point? I'm going to take all of them, and I'm going to aggregate information from all of them. The second key idea that distinguishes stable view synthesis, the new approach, from free view synthesis has to do with the blending and the processing, the aggregation of information from the source views. You see here that all the processing, all the reasoning happens in the coordinate frame of the target camera. What happens is that features from the source views are projected into the target frame, the coordinate space of the target view, and are integrated there by this recurrent convolutional network. That is not quite right, in my view. And that is one of the key arguments we make in the stable view synthesis paper. Because the actual appearance of the scene arises not really in the target camera. It arises on the surface of the scene. 
It arises on the surfaces of objects that make up the scene. That's where information should be aggregated. That's where the appearance is produced. The appearance is produced by light interacting with materials on the surfaces of objects in the scene. And the stable view synthesis approach takes a very different approach, a very different view to information aggregation. It aggregates information on the 3D surfaces and only then passes it on to the target camera. Let's do this step by step. The first step in stable view synthesis is the encoding of source images. This step is essentially the same as in free view synthesis. Every source image is taken and is passed through a convolutional network that produces a tensor of features, one feature vector per pixel in the source image. The second stage is key. These feature vectors from input pixels in the input images are back projected onto the geometric scaffold on the surface of the scene. You see them depicted here as green arrows. And you see some of the source views depicted here as green cameras. These green cameras are source views. Every point on the geometric scaffold is observed from some number of source views, some subset of source views. The subset need not be the same. In general, it is not the same. In general, each point on the scene, on the surface of the scene, is observed by a different set of cameras. No problem, says stable view synthesis. We'll take whatever feature vectors we can get from whatever pixels that correspond to this point on the surface. We'll take it from whatever set of cameras observe this point on the surface. And these are the green arrows at each point here. And you can see the number of green arrows is different. Some points are observed from more source cameras, some points from fewer. And uh, these correspond to different sets of cameras. Now, from this information, we need to produce feature vectors to pass on to a target view. The target view is depicted here in red. That is going to change at, at test time. Every frame as the camera moves, it's going to be a different set of views. No problem at all. This target view is red. We connect all points in the scene that can be seen from this target view to the target view by these red vectors. And now you can see that we have an interesting local geometric problem. At every point in this scene that has a red vector, we have some input feature vectors along these green arrows, and we need to produce an output feature vector along the red arrows. We train a differentiable deep set network to do this. This is essentially a set processing problem because there is no ordering among the green vectors. There is no first or second or third. It's just a lump of vectors that carry feature features along them. And the number of vectors can be different. The number of green vectors at some points can be two, some points three, four, 10, 15, no problem. We have a differentiable deep set model that given a set of input green vectors and a target red vector, it will produce a feature vector that corresponds to the target red vector. That is a network that we train. Given all these target red vectors produced by the deep set model, we can project them into the camera frame after information was aggregated on the surface with this deep set network that operates independently at each point on the geometric scaffold, we can collect the results into a nice feature tensor in the target view and then pass it through a neural rendering network that produces a color image. 
this is nice and simple, nice convolutional network. Again, zooming in on the information aggregation, the really key step, this is a two-dimensional didactic view of what happens with this differentiable deep set network, which is essentially a trainable differentiable appearance model. What it does is on each point in the scene, it takes a set of directions, directions VI, and along each direction, it takes a feature vector, a high dimensional feature vector, FI. There is some number of these, they are unordered and the number can change from point to point. Given this input, the deep set network needs to produce a new feature vector G corresponding to an output direction U. This should remind you of something. If you have background and rendering, this, this should remind you of reflectance functions. This is in some way a, an interpretation of a spatially varying reflectance function. We essentially have a trainable, differentiable reflectance function. It doesn't exactly produce radiance. It is one step removed from that. It's a bit more abstract and fuzzier than that. But we structurally have something akin to a reflectance function on the surface, which we can train, which we can estimate from data. Let's look at another scene, another example. Here are input images of this horse sculpture. Here's the result of free view synthesis, our last approach. And again, you see some serious artifacts, mostly in the form of missing regions. You, you can see gross missing regions in some frame. The horse is generally fine, but the areas outside the horse, not so much. And we can appreciate now that this comes from this heuristic selection of input images that don't completely account for all pixels in the target view. Because thinking of a small set of input images to be blended so as to produce that target view is in retrospect just, just fundamentally the wrong way to think about it. We shouldn't be thinking of blending images in the target view. We should be thinking of aggregating information on the surface of the scene. Because the set of relevant images changes from point to point on the surface of the scene. This idea of blending a subset of input images into the target view is in retrospect just fundamentally a limited and incomplete idea. Here is Nerf++ on this scene. And you can see that there is some fog there, there, there is some strange substance flying in midair. And this is due to the volumetric nature of neural radiance fields. Neural radiance fields operate as if each ray passes through participating media. And the appearance of the ray could change at any point, any point along the ray. It is fundamentally a volumetric approach, not a surface-based approach. And as such, as a volumetric-based approach, it is prone to this fuzziness, to hallucinating stuff in midair. There, there is really nothing that strongly regularizes neural radiance fields away from hallucinating participating media in midair. And you can see these kinds of artifacts quite often as you are, if you work hands-on with neural radiance fields. 
So it's definitely doing something very interesting and very non-trivial, but it's also overdoing it when it comes to free space because it's not really regularized properly and it doesn't really, deep down inside, it doesn't really understand the distinction between free space and the true solid objects. Here in comparison is stable view synthesis. And you can see that overall it's nice, clean, stable, no gross artifacts, as in free view synthesis, no hallucinating weird fog in midair as uh, neural radiance fields. And you can see the nice specular reflections on the surface of this bronze horse. So we're getting specular reflections, view-dependent effects, and overall very clean, stable appearance through this new trajectory through the scene. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison to drive the point home. You have free view synthesis on the left, clear artifacts due to this idea of blending a subset of images in the target view rather than on the surface of the scene. In comparison, stable view synthesis is clean and stable on the right. And in comparison with Nerf++, you have these hallucinated volumetric effects because ultimately it does not operate on the surface. There is no surface. There is just a giant volume in which the approach has just a little bit too much freedom to hallucinate. And again, in comparison, stable view synthesis, nice, stable, sharp results on the right. Of course, we have numbers to go with all of these qualitative results. There are extensive quantitative comparisons in the paper, and the numbers are actually extremely strong. We set the new state of the art on each data set we evaluate on three data sets in total and these are big big margins this is not one percent so on tanks and temples for example our main and most challenging data set if you look at lpips which is the most perceptually plausible the most interesting metric that is, that is closest to the actual appearance of the images as they are perceived by humans. On this LPIPS, we reduce the arrow by about 30% relative. So 10 percentage points from roughly 30s to roughly 20s, roughly 10 percentage points in absolute and 30% relative, 30% reduction in error across uh, across the scenes. So this is really, really massive. And you see these massive reductions in error relative to all existing approaches on all data sets we operate on. I will refer you to the paper for more details, and there are more details both in the evaluation, the results, and also in the techniques. There are interesting technical ideas there that I did not cover today. I encourage you to read the paper for the interesting tidbits and additional results. Let me end the first part of the talk with some broader comments. At the end of my last keynote, the Towards Photorealism talk, I mentioned a number of issues that I consider to be interesting opportunities for research. One of the issues that I dwelled on was the inference time, the image synthesis time with neural radiance fields. And I pointed out that with neural radiance fields, synthesizing one image can take on the order of a minute. And this is definitely an interesting opportunity. Well, I'm happy to report that this opportunity has been addressed uh, in a beautiful cluster of uh, concurrent work by a number of excellent teams. I think I list the papers 
here, roughly in the order that they were posted to archive. And they present just beautiful results, very interesting, very nice, clean ideas that accelerate image synthesis with neural radiance fields by three orders of magnitude. Just stunning, three orders of magnitude, beautiful image quality. This is beautiful work, really fantastic. And I encourage you to look at it, read these papers. I'm a really, really big fan. And to a very significant extent, the problem of image synthesis time, image synthesis performance with neural radiance fields, to a very significant extent, the problem, as I described it in my last talk, has been addressed. Here are a number of opportunities that I see now in this line of work. Here are, to me, the most interesting opportunities at this time. First, I'd like to see an integration of stable view synthesis and this surface-based approach and the neural radiance fields methodology, which is at core a volumetric methodology. They have complementary properties, complementary advantages and disadvantages. Stable view synthesis has an explicit notion of a surface, and thus it is explicitly regularized. Appearance is synthesized by light interacting with surfaces, and radiance remains constant as it propagates through free space as it really does in reality. This, this is true. This really is how light behaves. So stable view synthesis models something real. And I think this explicit modeling of the behavior of light helps in regularizing the representation of the scene and guiding the networks towards estimating the true appearance models and the true material properties. Neural radiance fields are less regularized, more flexible. As a result, they can more easily model complex phenomena that are closer to actually being truly volumetric in nature. Fuzzy things like, like hair or, or fur or translucent objects or refraction or indeed participating media like fog. If you really have participating media, well, that is intrinsically a volumetric phenomenon. Maybe you should be using a volumetric uh, representation to model that. Both approaches have merits and I think there are tasteful ways to integrate them so as to try to tap into both kinds of advantages. This explicit notion of a surface when it's appropriate. After all, look at this image. The vast majority, the bulk of the appearance of this image is really due to light interacting with surfaces. I mean, this is a surface. Light is hitting this shirt and is interacting with the material of this shirt and is reflected off this shirt. This is not light propagating through some milky volumetric substance. This is really a surface. So there is something real uh, surface-based approach is tapping into, but there is also something very appealing about the flexibility of the volumetric representation. I think there is a tasteful combination somewhere. That's one of the opportunities that I see. Second, as I pointed out in my last talk, these representations right now are primarily assuming a fixed frozen scene, and all you can do is move your head and look at it. You can look at it from different points of view, which is not nothing, but it's very far from the level of engagement afforded by classic graphics pipelines that really let you interact with the scene. You can go in and move objects and, 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 and essentially interact with the scene 
arbitrarily and the graphics pipeline will synthesize the appearance of the scene as it changes as it changes unpredictably as a result of your engagement with it these view synthesis approaches right now don't give us this kind of freedom while retaining their realism you either get freedom or you get realism i think the two should be combined i anticipate this happening within within the next few years and i think this is really one of the most exciting challenges right now in the field is retaining the level of realism that we've achieved with frozen static scenes translating it to interactive scenes that can be manipulated interactively unpredictably while retaining photorealism finally i think the definitive view synthesis approach should have a little bit more physics i talked about the spectrum between purely image-based, learning-based, data-driven approaches and very strongly physically-based approaches to view synthesis last time in my last talk. I will not recapitulate the whole story, but as I said last time, I think the right answer is somewhere in the middle. I think the right answer has some blend of data-driven ideas and physics-based ideas. I think the approach I presented today, for example, it's still very strongly on the data-driven side. And I think that's fine. It, it's actu it actually has a bit more physics than free view synthesis in that there, there's a stronger use of the surface and reasoning on the surface and aggregating information on the surface. I think that's that's closer to the physical processes that, that really give rise to uh, image appearance in, in reality. But I think there is room for a little bit more uh, physical modeling, a little bit more incorporation of our understanding of light transport and how image appearance arises out of the interaction of light and materials. Computer graphics is a bit different from computer vision in this respect. In computer vision, if you want to tell if an image is of a, phys is of a cat or a dog, physics is not necessarily the right way to think about this. We call something a cat because culturally, historically, we decided that this thing is going to be called a cat. We just decided that this thing is a cat and this other thing, dog. This is a data-driven decision. The only way to learn about this decision is really through data. There is no equation. There is no physical principle that will tell you that this thing is, should be called cat and this other thing should be called dog. The appearance of surfaces is a little bit different. The appearance of surfaces really is very strongly determined by the physics of light transport. Some aspects of it are data-driven. Uh, the fact that I'm wearing a blue shirt that has this particular appearance today, not a green one, not a gray one, well, that's a decision I made this morning. But the particular detailed appearance is very strongly due to the interaction of light that is hitting this material and is interacting with the properties of this material and reflecting off of it accordingly. And this is a very physical process, and this is a process that we understand. We have a very good first principles understanding of it, and I think there is a little bit more from this understanding that we can usefully incorporate into view synthesis techniques. With that, let me transition into the second part of my talk. And this is something that I'm incredibly excited about because this is new work that has never been presented and you are the first to see this. You are the first to see this outside our lab. This has been in progress for more than two years and uh, Stefan, 
the first author has been working on this for more than two years. This is a tremendous amount of work. And at this stage of my career, I really appreciate doing things that are hard and things that take a long time. This is a particular pleasure for me to invest in something that's really, really hard and doesn't yield after a few months of work and really requires on the order of years of concerted investment to really, really do something that really, really works. On this problem, it's actually easy to get a demo. It's easy to get something that kind of works to the extent that you can uh, collect some images that you can put in a paper. But it's hard to get something that really, really works. And I'm going to try to convince you with the following video sequences that what we have really, really works. Here is footage from the game Grand Theft Auto V. This is a wonderful game that we've been working with for many, many years. And what we're going to try to do here is make it look like reality. Now, of course, what does that mean? That's up to interpretation. I'm going to leave this undefined to some extent, but also defined to a different extent. And you will see what I mean. So you understand what Grand Theft Auto V looks like, right? You, you, you've, you've, you've seen this sequence. Here are the results of uh, our network, our approach. So this is a deep network that takes these same Grand Theft Auto V images, processes them, enhances their photorealism, and produces this, this sequence. It works frame by frame, image by image, and can be run interactively, can be plugged in uh, into the game, essentially post-processing the images produced by the game. We can look at these side by side to appreciate the difference. On the top left is the original game footage. On the bottom right are the results of uh, our approach, are the images produced by our convolutional network. You can see, for example, it forested this hill in the background. This has to do with its model of reality. What is reality for it? And for this, for this network, reality is the cityscapes data set. That's where it derives its understanding of reality. It was exposed to reality through the cityscapes data set, which is a data set of images from Germany and uh, Central Europe. And Germany and Central Europe are much more lush, much greener, uh, LA, which is depicted in the game, uh, game Grand Theft Auto, is parched and dry, and so it has these kinds of dry, parched hills. Our network has never seen such dry hills in reality. It saw verdant green hills in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and so forth. And so it essentially reforested that, it forested that hill to make it look more like the reality that it saw during training. Among many other changes it made, look at the road. It completely retextured the road. This is not just changing the colors. Look at the texture of the road here in Grand Theft Auto and look at the texture of the road here in the result of our model. This is a completely different texture. Our model kept the content but restyled uh, the surfaces quite deeply at, at the level of the texture and the materials, not just color. Let's look at a different sequence. This is going to be a fairly long sequence driving through a residential area. This is the original Grand Theft Auto V appearance. I'm going to uh, switch to the results of our approach. I'm going to let you look at this for a few more seconds to uh, get the impression of the Grand Theft Auto V style, what it looks like. 
All right, here is uh, our approach, the result of our network. The way I aim to convince you that this really, really works is by showing you long uninterrupted video sequences, not just an image here, an image there, but we're just gonna keep driving. We're just gonna keep driving and I want you to appreciate that the results are stable, okay? Stable, nothing major goes wrong. That's what took two years. Getting a little demo so that we could collect images for a paper, we were there within about half a year. What took two years is getting this thing to be rocked solid so that it just doesn't hallucinate any artifacts, doesn't hallucinate trees in the sky, as you will see, uh, doesn't introduce any major artifacts, any major temporal instability. Basically, it just keeps going at a point where we can now imagine this technology being integrated into production computer graphics pipelines to make real-time computer graphics look like this, look cinematic look like reality. Let's look at this side by side. Top left is the Grand Theft Auto V sequence. Bottom right is the result of our approach. Let me show you a couple of baselines and I'm going to show you on the top left the results of a couple of very recent state-of-the-art unpaired image-to-image -image translation models. Structurally, uh, the problem is essentially unpaired image-to-image -image translation. On the top left here, you see the result of a recent state-of-the-art image-to-image -image translation model published in the very last conference cycle the very last conference cycle, ECCV 2020. And you can see that, well, it's doing something. It's definitely restyling, restyling the image, but it's also introducing artifacts. And you will actually understand some of these artifacts better when we talk about the details of our approach. I want you to notice two things. One is that this baseline is prone to hallucinating trees in the sky once in a while. So you, 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 you'll see some green patches. It's trying to populate the sky with the vegetation. It seems that it's somehow confused about that. And I'm going to remark on this again in a few minutes and you will understand why. The other is, look at these Mercedes stars. It keeps hallucinating a Mercedes star. It really, really, really wants there to be a Mercedes star on the hood of the car. All right. Here is another baseline from the same conference cycle. This is again ECCV 2020, the very last computer vision conference cycle. This is TSIT, another state of the art, excellent approach to uh, unsupervised image to image uh, translation. Structurally, uh, essentially, the, the kind of problem that uh, we are solving here, you see that it, it, it has issues. It has issues with uh, stability, the color distribution goes awry quite often, and it hallucinates high frequency artifacts. Just like the previous baseline cut, this thing hallucinates high frequency artifacts. You can see some patches that it hallucinates in the sky, and you can see just extraneous patches being plopped into the image. In comparison, again, take a look at our result, just stable, just rock solid, just keeps going. So what is our model of reality? This is reality uh, as far as the network you saw is concerned. I'm going to show you the results in a bit for other stand-ins for reality, but reality has to be represented somehow. And uh, to our model, reality is represented by the Cityscapes data set. It's a quirky data set. It's an interesting representation of reality because uh, the images were all taken 
by automotive grade cameras. These were not really intended for human eyes, for human, uh, human consumption. So you see that they're quite desaturated. They are not really vibrant. The, 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 the colors are, are, are quite dull. And in terms of the content, it definitely has a particular style, right? These are all German, primarily German, but also Swiss, Austrian, Central European cities. Uh, there, there's a clear bias in the layout here. For better or for worse, this data set has been used as a standard data set for this kind of uh, research. We've grown to love it. And uh, the results I'm showing you are with reality being represented by the Cityscapes data set. The overall structure of our approach is quite similar to the overall structure of other unpaired image-to-image -image translation models with a few key differences. The first key difference is that we don't just take the image rendered by the game and try to enhance it, restyle it, repaint it into an image that looks real, uh, cinematic. We also take a number of intermediate buffers produced by the game engine. We make the point that taking computer graphics images, images produced by computer graphics pipelines and trying to make them look real is a different problem than just blind image to image translation because we do have auxiliary information. The original image was produced by a graphics pipeline. And the graphics pipeline produces intermediate representations of the scene that are actually quite useful. It gives you a depth map. It can give you a normal map. It gives you additional information about materials, object segmentation. There are a bunch of buffers that are produced basically by default during the operation of modern graphics engines. We take these buffers. We process them, we encode them through an appropriately designed deep network, and we pass them through the image enhancement network that is restyling the image. These are auxiliary buffers that are informing the synthesis process. Second, we have an auxiliary loss here that in addition to the standard generative adversarial network, see if you can tell which image is real loss, in addition, we say that the image should retain the content of the original rendered image. So we have this original rendered image. What we want is for the network to make this look real without messing with the content. We don't want it to put trees in the sky. We don't want it to put uh, uh, to put trees on the road. We don't want it to rearrange the scene. We want it to essentially keep the same content, just make it look real. For that, we pass the synthesized image and the original rendered image. We compare them with the perceptual dissimilarity metric. We use LPIPs. And this is one of the losses that are used for training. The network should fool the discriminator and produce an image that looks real to the discriminator, but also an image that deviates as little as possible from the original rendered image at, at, at the perceptual level, the structural level, the content level as evaluated at different scale by, scales by this LPIPS loss. The G buffers are encoded by a specially designed encoder that operates on multiple object classes. There are multiple object IDs maintained by the game. Sky, car, vegetation, road. The G buffer encoder is designed so that it can actually apply different encoding that is learned end-to-end -end adaptively during the training process. 
two different semantic classes. So it can encode the car pixels differently from the way it encodes the sky pixels and the tree pixels. Furthermore, it outputs encoded feature tensors at different resolutions. And these encoded feature tensors produced by this encoder at different resolutions are going to feed into the image enhancement network. You will see them hook into the image enhancement network at different resolutions. Here are some of the G buffers that uh, our network looks at. Normal, depth, albedo, uh, other material properties, segmentation, we can, which we can derive automatically from G buffers produced by the game as described in one of our uh, prior work. And, and these G buffers do make a difference. It does make a difference. Uh, this is one of the things we evaluate in our controlled experiments. This is the image enhancement network. Overall, it has the structure of an HR net, a family of convolutional networks developed in computer vision. This is overall an HR net with auxiliary G buffer features at different resolutions fed into the appropriate levels of this HR net and with a basic residual block that has been modified and customized. And for the details, I will refer you to the paper, which will be public in about a week. Uh, the details do matter in this work as well. The details matter. The details are what took two years. Uh, the details matter and uh, the details are described in, in the paper. The perceptual discriminator is also interesting and has a number of uh, key decisions that are a bit different. First of all, in addition to looking at images, it also passes the images through a pre-trained, robust, cross-domain semantic segmentation network. We use the MSEG network that my lab released last year. This MSEG cross-domain semantic segmentation network is applied to all images. It produces label maps. These label maps are passed to the discriminator as well to make it easier for the discriminator to compare the semantic content of the images as well. Furthermore, the discriminator operates on perceptual features extracted through a pre-trained VGG network at multiple scales, and the discrimination happens at multiple scales. Furthermore, what is this discriminator applied to? One natural choice that is made in prior work is to just look at full, full images. Let's just look at, a, at the whole image. The more context, the better, right? Or if we cannot fit full images into memory, let's try to take really big, big parts of images and pass these really big chunks of images to the discriminator. That's how we started out as well. And it turned out that that was a bad idea because the overall layout of images produced by, for example, GTA, and the overall layout of images in, let's say, the Cityscapes data set are actually different. We call this a structural shift. Let's look at the probability that a particular pixel in the image has tree, has vegetation in it. So let's look here at the top. You see that in GTA, there is a very small probability of vegetation at the top. For various reasons, LA, which GTA models, just doesn't have very many trees up, up here. Cityscapes, on the other hand, is abundantly populated with trees up here in the top part of the image. What this means is that even if the generator just perfectly restyles the image, changes the appearance of the GTA image so that it, it just looks like a movie, just looks cinematic, it looks incredible, indistinguishable from reality, the discriminator can still flag it as an unreal computer graphics image just by looking at some pixel here and asking, is this tree? And if it's not tree, it can say, well, probably it's a GTA image, even if it looks real in terms of its uh, color, texture, all, uh, all of that. 
I know that from real images, I should expect lots of trees up here, and I don't see trees up here, so that. In response to that, what we've noticed the generator do is try to cheat and put, for example, trees in the sky. Or put, for example, the little Mercedes star in the hood, because that's another thing that the discriminator can latch on to during training. Our solution to this, one of our solutions, we, we have a number of measures that mitigate this tendency, but one of them is to operate on smaller patches with compatible semantic layout. We don't feed the discriminator full images or big patches, uh, big chunks of images from the same part of the field of view. We operate on smaller patches to force the discriminator to look at, at, at the detailed appearance rather than the structural layout. These are representative patches, as you can see here on the screen. And then for each patch sampled from a processed GTA image, we sample a patch with compatible semantic content, compatible perceptual content, from cityscapes images, even if it's in a, in a different part of the field of view. And we can do this by comparing perceptual features, again, extracted from pre-trained convolutional networks like, uh, like the VGG network. And here you see uh, corresponding patches extracted from cityscapes images. This is a real example. These are randomly sampled patches from GTA images, and these are the kinds of corresponding automatically retrieved patches from cityscapes images that the discriminator would be trained on. Let me show you some more results and some more comparisons to prior work. On the top left, again, original GTA footage. On the bottom right, the result of our approach. Again, you can see that the engagement with the appearance of the image is quite deep. It's not just changing color distributions. It, I mean, it for, ex for example, it essentially restyles, completely retextures the road. Here is, a, again, a comparison to this cut baseline, a CUT, uh, a paper an excellent paper from uh, the very last conference cycle, ECCV 2020. And now you can appreciate again the, the hallucination of trees in the sky. We think we know why this is happening. We think we know why it's doing that. And, and it's, it's this behavior that I, I explained to you. And notice also the, the great temptation for this approach to put a mercy to abundantly sprinkle Mercedes stars here on the hood to try to fool the, the, uh, the discriminator. All right, here is this TSIT, uh, the other state of the art, unpaired image to image translation method from the last conference cycle. And you can again see it has problems with temporal stability, it hallucinates patches, it has high frequency artifacts. Again, uh, you can look at our result on the bottom right and see that it's just very, very stable and clean. Now you can ask, isn't this just color transfer? Can't we get a comparable effect? with uh, color transfer. And there is a family of beautiful, classic color transfer approaches that change the color distribution of an image to, make, uh, to match a target. Uh, there is, for example, the now classic paper by Reinhardt 20 years ago uh, that, that this, did this. And uh, we show the results here on the top left. What it does have going for it is that it's stable. It's stable. Color transfer is stable. It doesn't hallucinate high frequency artifacts. It's stable and it's doing something. It's, it's, it's not bad, it's doing something. But you can see here on the bottom right that again, our manipulation is just much, much deeper. We really go in and for example, if you look at the road, 
you can really see that just all the textures are the same. The color transfer doesn't really engage with the textures, it just manipulates the, the color histogram of the image. Whereas our network really engages at the level of individual pixels and patches, and essentially repaints the image, it restyles the image at the level of, uh, uh, of textures. Here is another baseline. This is a state-of-the-art photographic style transfer approach. And you could ask, well, can't we get comparable effects to what, what we're doing with photographic style transfer? Photographic style transfer is a related line of work that manipulates an image to match the style of a reference photograph. And we can look at the results of a state-of-the-art photographic style transfer method on the top left here. And we can see that it's, it's not quite there. It is doing something, but it has issues with temporal stability, and it just overall has, has issues with, with the realism. It's not bad, it's doing something, but it's, it's not at the level of our work. Of course, all the qualitative statements that I'm making can be quantified, and we have extensive quantitative evaluation in the paper. Uh, there is a standard metric that in prior work has essentially been adopted as the best known metric for evaluating this, this kind of work. This is this kernel inception distance that uh, existing work argues is, is the best metric known for this kind of work. And we win by this kernel inception distance. And we compare to a large number of uh, approaches from different families. Uh, you can see here some other approaches I haven't really shown in video, like Munit, Cicada, uh, Spade. Those of you who work in this area will, will recognize uh, these names, as well as additional color transfer and photographic style transfer baselines. Furthermore, we actually argue that this KID is incomplete and it has some drawbacks. And we introduce a family of new metrics that we think are even better than this kernel inception distance. And they evaluate image similarity uh, more discriminatively at different levels of detail, at, at different perceptual scales. And it's this family of SKVD metrics that are described in our paper. And needless to say, our approach does very, very well, fantastically well, also by this AK SKVD metric on multiple scales. We have uh, an abundance of controlled experiments that have examined different decisions that we make in our pipeline, like the decision to use G buffers, like the decision to feed smaller patches to the discriminator, the way in which we ingest G buffers, the architecture of our discriminator, uh, and so forth. All of this is examined through controlled experiments that you can read about in the paper. And we also have perceptual experiments that ask people, real people, on Amazon Mechanical Turk they get a pair of images. There is an image synthesized by our approach, and there is an image synthesized by one of the baselines, or an original Grand Theft Auto image. And we ask them which image is more realistic, which image is a real photograph, which image is more real. And um, the number here is the percentage of people, the fraction of people, the percentage of people that think our image is more real. And of course, 50 is chance. 50 is they can't tell the difference. More than 50 means our image is better. They prefer our image. If you compare to the original GTA images, ours are better. People say our images are better, more realistic, more like photographs than the original GTA images. For these bars, higher is better for us, but worse for the baseline. In particular, what this ordering can tell you is that according to this protocol and according to these mechanical Turk workers, all the baselines make things worse than the original GTA. They all do more harm than good. All of them are deemed less realistic 
in comparison to our images than the original GTA images. They're actually worse. And we think the reason is that while they do do some good, they also introduce artifacts. And these are telltale high frequency artifacts that counter balance, that negate the benefits of these approaches. Our approach is the only one where the benefits are not canceled out by gross artifacts that are introduced along the way. And of course, with respect to all baselines, our images are deemed more realistic and sometimes much, much more realistic, overwhelmingly more realistic. Now, I mentioned to you that for all the results you've seen so far, the model of reality, the stand-in for reality that our network saw was the Cityscapes dataset. Uh, this is in part for historical reasons and reasons of compatibility with other work in this field that overwhelmingly uses the Cityscapes dataset. And I've shown you excellent results on the Cityscapes dataset, and I'm personally very used to it, and I like it a lot, and I, I like I've grown to like that, uh, that appearance. But we can also train our network with different data sets, and we've done that, and we report that in the paper, and I want to show you one such result, where instead of the Cityscapes data set for representing reality, we use the Mapillary Vistas data set. And the Mapillary Vistas data set is very, very different. It is taken not with automotive cameras, but with human cameras, smartphone cameras primarily, that were actually optimized for human consumption. So the images appear much more vibrant, much more saturated. The colors pop, as you can see here. The data set is much, much more diverse. It's also structurally, geographically more diverse. It's not just Germany and Central, Central Europe. It's images from all over the world and images that, because of the cameras that are used, are much more colorful, saturated, and vibrant. When our model is trained with the Mapillary Vistas data set as its stand-in for reality, it produces what you see here on the top left. What you see here on the bottom right is the same Cityscapes result from the Cityscapes trained model. Top left, same model, same model, just trained on the Mapillary Vistas data set. And you see it's, it's a different appearance. It, it's a different interpretation of reality. In some ways, it's a less drastic departure from the original appearance of GTA 5 because the model now understands that being vibrant and colorful and having bright colors, that's actually okay. You can see that in reality too. Bright colors are compatible with reality. So the difference from the original GTA appearance is less striking, but it, it does do quite a lot. And you can see that the appearance is different. You can again look at the road and you can see that our network has restyled, retextured, resurfaced this road, for example. And throughout the image, you can see that it's quite different and it's, it's quite interesting. To me, it's quite interesting to look at. And I think we are not far away from real-time computer games looking like this. And you can pick. You can pick your flavor of reality. You can pick whether your game looks like, like the flavor of reality on the top left, or like the flavor of reality on the top right, or some other flavor some other flavor that you can specify. I will refer you to the paper for many, many more details. This was a massive amount of work with many interesting ideas. The paper should be public in about a week. We will post it on archive with associated materials within a week or so of this keynote. You were the first to see this. I'm very, very excited to share this with you. I'm looking forward to your questions. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions or comments. 
We're looking forward to seeing what you are going to do with this. Thank you so much for your attention today.